Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Patreon-sponsored review time again. And of course it is, because why the hell would I watch this damn thing if I wasn't being paid to? Last year, when I reviewed Batman v Superman Giant Monsters All Out Attack, I expressed the sentiment that while I hated that movie, I thought it was still better than Man of Steel. It was an opinion that a lot of people were confused about, because they thought Man of Steel was pretty decent, even if they didn't like the overall direction of the DC Cinematic Universe. Not me, though! I despise Man of Steel! It makes me appreciate other terrible Superman movies more. Its only rivals for potential worse Superman movies would be some of those un produced Superman Lives scripts when it was in development hell before becoming Superman Returns. And honestly, it feels like they cribbed some stuff from those for this. Now, as with the Batman v Superman review, if you enjoyed Man of Steel, absolutely love it, good for you! A review is just an opinion, and we have different ones. You do not have to agree with my opinion, and I am not some supreme arbiter of what you should and should not enjoy, what you think is a good Superman movie or not. These are just my thoughts, the things that I can't get past. I even understand if you're a diehard Atop the Fourth Wall fan, but can't watch this one because it's trash-talking and deconstructing a film you like. Feel free to skip it! You don't have to watch things you don't like. I do, however, because 14 years ago I decided I hated myself and wanted to be miserable every week! I will try to be fair to things I like in this movie. There's not a huge amount, but there are some things that I thought were handled well. The movie's not unwatchable, and I can certainly understand why casual viewers wouldn't have any problems with it whatsoever. But of course, a lot of people have been wanting me to cover this one for quite a bit, even though, again, my focus is the comic books, not the movies. But I think some people really wanted me to go off on this film because of the vlog I made on it years ago. No, seriously, occasionally I get people asking me to restore old movie vlogs from when I was on Blip. But the Man of Steel one, people really wanted again. They were asking all the dang time to the point where I finally re-uploaded it and kept it unlisted, accessible via my website, because I don't really like putting up years-old unscripted content that might affect my place in the algorithm. And dang it, if I'm gonna screw myself over on YouTube, I'm gonna do it by uploading anything besides History of Power Rangers. I have a system here. But yeah, people talk about how absolutely depressing it was watching me hate on Man of Steel in that vlog. Like it had some sort of psychological effect on me. It was nine years ago, and we've had several more movies like it since then. The sheer punch in the face that was this movie has dulled with time. But that doesn't mean it's painless. Like with the aforementioned Superman Lives, there's actually a long history of production around the film and trying to get it made. Though for me, the only really interesting detail that I gleamed was that at one point, Guillermo del Toro was offered the director's chair, but turned it down to work on an adaptation of H.P. Lovecraft's At the Mountains of Madness. Which really sucks for two reasons. One, we missed out on a Superman movie made by Guillermo del Toro, and two, his version of At the Mountains of Madness still hasn't happened! Come to think of it, there still hasn't been a big budget adaptation of At the Mountains of Madness yet. What the hell? I mean, I feel like it's one of the easier ones to translate into an action horror movie. Drama and danger on the ice, a mysterious expedition destroyed, discovering alien horrors in the mountains. Why is there only like one low budget UK movie from last year and a cartoon maybe? It's in the public domain for crying out loud! What the hell happens in Hollywood that Man of Steel gets made, but still no At the Mountains of Madness? Yes, I know I'm stalling, but dang it, I don't want to rewatch this movie! Yeah, yeah, I suppose I should just get it over with. Let's dig into Man of Steel. And hey, it's only a two-hour film versus a three-hour one, so at least this review will be shorter than the Batman v Superman review, right? Right? Always on his couch, Linkara. 
We open the film with Laura Lorvan, Clark's biological mother, giving birth to him. <sighs> Immediately, I have complaints. Now, to be fair, these are nitpicky complaints. They have no real bearing on the film whatsoever, and if this had been a movie I liked, I'd probably gloss over this more as just goofy things to point out, but no. It's just an ever-escalating mountain of things I dislike about it. Feel free to skip this portion. Here, here's a time code, but otherwise, it's my show, and if I have to sit here and watch this crap, then I'm gonna be thorough. Plot-wise, what is actually served by showing us Kal-El's birth? We'll later learn that this is the first naturally born child on Krypton in centuries, but we don't need to see that, and frankly, it doesn't really make much difference in the plot anyway. And it's shot and edited in a way that, like, stuff is getting blurry and unfocused before getting focused again, and, and I can see that if the scene was meant to be, like, a chaotic action scene, where we're supposed to feel like we're there with the characters, and it's intense and hard to follow because action can be like that, but it's not! It's a woman giving birth! Why are they filming it like this? And the music is this slow drone that just permeates the rest of the film. Oh, yeah, I've gotta bring that up. Hans Zimmer's score sucks! He said he wanted to distinguish it from past Superman movie music, and... Congratulations! He succeeded by making it dull and dreary. The two exact opposites of what Superman should be. Here's my impression of this score. Da, da, da. Man of Steel. It's like the music building up to an actual tune, but it gets sleepy and just gives up before we hit the exciting part of the song. And then we get shots of this thing, like some kind of weird Kryptonian monitor showing the baby's heartbeat and the baby itself, but if you have the technology to have these CGI sand recreations of it, why not just a regular camera and monitor image? Why is the technology like this? And this is really the minorest of nitpicks, but... I've gotten really sick and tired over the last decade of CGI sand technology. Like, Hollywood frickin' loves having lots of tiny little grains of sand forming into objects, and it stopped being impressive years ago, but they keep having super advanced sci-fi tech use it, even when it seems impractical in-universe. Like, I watched Star Trek Discovery's third season last year, and there's a bit where a bed becomes a desk through CGI sand. Why? Why is this better than just having a desk and a bed as separate objects? It's not like you have a limited space for furniture. It doesn't make it better. It's there for the sake of the effects budget rather than to serve the story. And thus I bring it back to this movie. Why do we have CGI sand showing the baby in heartbeat? Even if this is just the aesthetics of their technology and how their cameras work, which, you know, Kryptonians are so superior to us in terms of their super technology, but apparently haven't figured out how to make images any other color except brown and gray? What purpose is served by showing Jor-El the heart while she's giving birth? What good is this information? How is it useful outside of the narrative for the audience? Is it to not so subtly show us that Kal-El has a heart? No kidding! He's frickin' Superman! Whatever, Kal-El is born and we get to see that Krypton is full of weird animal life in nature, probably to help establish something goofy we'll see soon. But otherwise, the transition is just weird because it makes me think of the Lion King instead of anything Superman related. Jor-El says to the Council of Unnecessarily Huge Chairs that Krypton's core is collapsing due to them mining it, and it may be only a matter of weeks before the planet... Well, blows up. And the worst part is, you know they won't get the deposit back. Also, get a load of this guy's outfit. Apparently, Wire Sheik was really in before Krypton was lost. There. Sure glad I don't look stupid in this. Jor-El says it's too late to evacuate the main population of the planet, but they can send off the genetic codex of their people to safety so their race can survive in some form. The meeting gets interrupted by General Zod and his forces, who are staging a coup because of Krypton's impending collapse. Zod offers Jor-El a chance to join him, but Jor-El's a little reluctant given Zod says they'll sever the the degenerative bloodlines that led them to this state. Since he refuses, they take Jor-El away, but he quickly escapes with the help of his CGI sand robot. He calls up Lara and pfft. Okay, no. Why? Why is this superior to just, like, a camera? What person on Krypton decided, you know how phone calls should work? Have people rendered like they were a PlayStation 2 cutscene. Either this thing deliberately made her hair look like that, or after she gave birth, Lara decided to shape her hair to look like that with as much gel was left on Krypton. Full-blown civil war has apparently broken out, so naturally, with all these floating spaceships and anti-gravity cars and tanks flying around, 
Jor-El picks the most logical way to get back home. A flying dragon that he just yells out to come pick him up. Has that thing just been flying in circles around the council building? Do other people have flying dragons in this society? I mean, I know I would want my own pet flying dragon if I had the choice, but why isn't that thing perched somewhere? And how common is it when everybody is flying around in supercars? How did the thing even hear him call out when everything else is going on? He just yelled out into the sky its name. At least I think he was calling its name. I challenge you to decode what the hell it is he yelled here. He goes to collect the genetic codex first, which is apparently stored in this building with open top pools of water that he can just leap into and swim to grab. Why doesn't this place have a roof? Even if you weren't worried about people doing exactly what Jorel is doing here, wouldn't you want to prevent the dragons from pooping in there while flying around? Also, the genetic codex is... like... a skull. It's just a little skull that's floating with some energy ribbons going into it. Whose skull is this? Why is this the source of all Kryptonian genetic engineering for their people? From a production standpoint, why go with this instead of just, like, a row of super advanced computers that he pulls a space thumb drive out of or something? Why did this have to be a big pool of water surrounded by organic technology? See, that's also what's so weird about this movie. Its budget was not that much higher than Superman Returns seven years ago, yet it feels like a lot of the budget went into stuff like this for Krypton's design elements that are just bizarrely, unnecessarily more alien than they need to be. We're already suspending our disbelief because Kryptonians are aliens that look just like humans. We don't need the aesthetics to be so far removed from normal humans that you could replace them with, like, fish people or insectoids and it would still fit. As he escapes, his dragon gets injured. Easy, Haraka. Thanks, jor -El. I might have actually survived a little longer, but sure, give me even more pain and suffering as we crash down. I'm going real easy now, asshole. He puts the skull into this digital reader thing? Why does he have this? Or do they sell little skull souvenirs at the baby factory swimming pools gift shop that you can just put into these things? Anyway, Lara and CGI Sand Robot say they found the planet that they'll be sending Kal-El to. Earth. Noting, of course, that its son will grant him power. He'll be an outcast. A freak. Oh. He'll be a god to them. Ugh, some parents just set too high expectations for their kid's future. Lara laments this whole plan, that it could go wrong, that they'll never get to see him walk or hear him say their names. It's tragic stuff, perfectly good for a Superman movie. Anyway, the device disintegrates the skull and then... sends it into Kal-El's body? I guess? And yet there's also indeed a little thumb drive with the House of L symbol on the end of it, so I guess they do have the technology to store information on things other than skulls, so I don't even know why they had the skull. Anyway, as Lara launches Kal-El out, Zod's forces arrive and attack. Jor-El informs Zod about him having a natural birth, which pisses him off. They fight each other and, man, Zod just gets wailed on. Then again, he is fighting Russell Crowe. Fight! Round the world. Kal-El is launched, and in his anger at losing the Codex, Zod stabs Jor-El. He seems quite indifferent to his death, and it takes Lara several seconds to lightly jog over to his body, and I guess cry a little? Her performance is really subdued, and in fact a lot of the Kryptonian stuff at the start here plays it a bit too low-key in my opinion. Just very flat. Michael Shannon as Zod is trying, but he doesn't have the natural charisma of Terrence Stamp. He's always bug-eyed and looking kind of confused all the time. It's not the worst performance, but as someone who's going to end up being the main villain, he doesn't really project the kind of menace he should be to be a foe against Superman. And I promise, I'm going to minimize comparisons to the Christopher Reeve movies. This film should stand on its own without needing to live up to stuff made 35 years beforehand. It's just movie-wise, there's only been one other Zod, and it kind of set a high standard. Zod tries to have Kal-El's pod shot down, but his forces are intercepted by the Kryptonian government, which manages to end his attempted coup and arrest him. He's sentenced to 300 cycles of somatic reconditioning, and Shannon gets a chance to ham it up a bit, screaming at Lara that he'll find Kal-El. I will find him! Somatic reconditioning apparently involves getting covered in CGI goop and being launched into space. Sure, it's phallic. Why wouldn't it be? So, dumb question, they do have space flight technology, as seen here, but the Council earlier scoffed at the idea of mass evacuation, 
but they're okay with sending out treasonous murderers into space? Like, did no one else on Krypton decide, you know, maybe I'll ride this out in orbit instead of staying down here? Speaking of, the planet starts breaking apart. There is no refuge, Kilo. And frankly, I'm just kind of indifferent about that. Eh, I'm gonna go take a nap, wait for this to blow over. Think a better world than ours, girl. Preferably one with less volcanoes. And so, 19 minutes in, Krypton finally goes explodey. Now, in my opinion, spending this much time on Krypton is a major mistake. Spending some time to set up Zod. Not bad, he is the main villain. But then again, should Zod have been the main villain of this movie? But see, it's not just that. There is another reason why we spend so much time with Jor-El and Krypton, but I'll get into that later. The pod arrives on Earth and we cut to the present, where Kal-El, now Clark, is working on a fishing boat. Yeah, in a weird editing choice, the movie is now non-linear for a bit, jumping around in the timeline. You can still follow what's happening fine, but it's just... What is served by doing this? It's not like we're seeing a mystery unfold, like, oh my god, why is he on a boat? What new spore of madness is this? It's just, here's Clark doing normal stuff for a bit while we occasionally flash back to various incidents that occurred as he grew up. Why is this better than just seeing it play out in order? The boat receives a distress call from a nearby oil platform, and they decide to go help. However, the Coast Guard orders them to not go in because of the risk of an explosion. Overhearing, Clark heads in to help them. Fortunately, while he was extremely flammable because of all the oil he's slathered on himself, he's immune to CGI fire. He's able to save the workers and the rescue helicopter, and as he's in the water, we have a flashback to his childhood. His powers suddenly start kicking in right in the middle of class all at once. He can hear every sound in the area, his x-ray vision is spiking in and out. Naturally, he's a child and he can't control it, so he runs out of the classroom and locks himself in a closet. Martha Kent is called and brought in to help, but then we get this slightly weird dialogue. The world's too big, Mom. Was there a deleted scene that that line is supposed to be a callback to? Because the world's too big is not what I would say if I suddenly could see through people or hear every single tiny noise. It's the kind of thing he'd say after he flew up high for the first time or was hearing, say, every disaster on Earth at once or something. Not, oh no, I can hear people tapping a pencil while also them whispering. It's a perfectly fine line, but what is it doing here in this context is what I'm saying. Martha tells him to make it smaller, focus only on her voice, and it's a good, sweet scene. Now, I don't mind Clark having the sensory overload as he gets his powers. It makes sense. It can humanize both him and his parents as we see some bit of othering while also seeing his development throughout life. My main problem is we'll later learn that this is not because of him going through puberty or the like, where his powers would suddenly start being a thing, but rather, it's Earth's atmosphere and whatnot being different from Krypton. But if that's the problem, why is it happening now? Martha will later say that he struggled to breathe as a baby, so he acclimated to the atmosphere that much younger. Why does it take him until, like, age 8 or whatever for this to happen, while for other Kryptonians, it's immediately upon being exposed to the air? Also, dumb question, but why can't the teacher get in? Wouldn't she or the principal or the janitor or whatever have the key? It's not like Clark was holding it closed the whole time or something. He's away from the door, trying to get his powers under control. The teacher had time to phone his mom to come help, but she's just trying the doorknob this whole time. And then Clark accidentally uses his heat vision on it briefly. I know, I know, a lot of this is nitpicking and stuff like the door doesn't actually matter. It's the emotions and character stuff revolving around Clark, his mom, and his developing powers, but... I know where the movie is going! I know what's gonna happen! So the journey and its destination frustrate me so that I start thinking about everything else that's bugging me! Back in the present, I guess there were some whales just hanging around the exploded oil rig that wake him up. Back on land, he goes to steal some clothes that were hung out to dry in an overcast sky and the sound of rain beginning to start. Fortunately for him, there's an open car in the driveway of this place with some dry pants that he takes instead. Spotting a school bus, that leads us to another childhood flashback. Their school bus's tire bursts and is sent over a bridge into the water. Like with Lara, apparently the kids take quite a while to register what's happening because while they just stare at the front of the bus waist deep in water, Clark heads to the emergency door and opens it. Swimming out and pushes the bus back onto land. He even rescues Pete Ross, despite him bullying Clark a minute ago. This scene is notable for two reasons. One, the crappy little tune that I mentioned earlier actually kind of works here, I'll grant that. It's not meant to be bombastic. And secondly, 
wow, this bright yellow bus is the most color we've had in this movie so far. The recurring joke I kept making when I saw the trailer to this was, Wow, I wish this movie was in color. Yeah, yeah, I know. Everyone's complained about how dull and gray and terrible the color palette is of these movies. It's nothing new. But it's just such a bizarre choice. This is not meant to be a dark film. Or at least it's a Superman movie that's starting a new franchise off, and it should not look like this. Everything just kind of feels flat and washed out. It's not fun to watch, and I feel no sense of joy and excitement. Maybe if it got brighter and more colorful as it went along, you know, transitioning from a more mundane world to one that's more exciting and vibrant, but no, it's not like that. This is the color palette of... A family drama about someone coming back home after their father died to try to come to terms with the crap they experienced in their childhood. Not a Superman movie. It has the same kind of color scheme as The Ring. Samara is going to come crawling out of a well to try to drag these kids to hell for escaping the bus death. And oh my god, why haven't we had Superman versus Samara before? The use of color in this movie looks more like a horror movie. And I'm not even against a dark Superman movie, one where this kind of color palette would be appropriate. But this is supposed to be introducing us to this Superman. This is someone's first exposure to the character. The character who was a symbol of hope and humanity and truth and justice and all that. Get the essential idea of the character across first, then you can challenge it with darkness of moral grays and situations that are not easily solved by a guy flying around with super strength. Visually, the movie just becomes a gray sludge for me. Nothing that makes me want to cheer or be excited about anything that's happening, and I feel unengaged and lethargic, especially since what's actually happening in the film isn't really that compelling or good. Oh, and that brings us to the first real major misstep of this film. The one that really started to make me hate it. The stuff that it could never recover from. Pete Ross's mom stops by to talk about what Clark did, Jonathan and Martha trying to deny it and claim that they just think he and the other kids saw this. I'm sure what he thought he saw was... was an act of God, Jonathan. This was providence. What happened here was a miracle, and I want you to fucking acknowledge it. After accomplishing nothing with that sequence, Jonathan goes out to talk to Clark, reminding him that he needs to keep his powers a secret. What was I supposed to do? Just let him die? Maybe. Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you forever. Fuck yourselves. Go fuck yourselves, you fucks. Jonathan Kent. The person who instilled the morals that makes Superman what he is. The sole most important figure in his life as he grew up. Says maybe he should have let children die to preserve his secret. And he doesn't take that back. Doesn't acknowledge, no, no, you should have, you're right. But there are other ways to do it while still protecting yourself. His follow-up is just... But the world is going to change when they find out about you, Clark. We have to be more worried about that than the children who could have died. Vague, metaphysical concepts about, oh, what it means to be human could be changed if it turns out an alien crashed on Earth and has been saving people. What a load of crap. No wonder the movie's colors are washed out. Its sense of priorities and ethics are just like that. You saw how Pete's mom reacted, right? She was scared of Clark. No, she wasn't! She was calling it a miracle! Again, was there a deleted scene where she called Clark a monster or dangerous or something? I mean, yeah, she could still be afraid of Clark for that. People can be irrational and stupid, but Jonathan Kent is making stuff up or working on some different version of events than what we saw. Is she right? Did God do this to me? My boat. Jonathan finally shows Clark the Kryptonian ship he arrived in, confirming to him that he isn't from Earth. It's another way of saying that it's not from this world, Clark. And neither are you. That phrasing really bothers me. I know he's just saying that he's an alien, but, but that specific word choice, it, it suggests to me, you're not from this world, thus this world shouldn't matter to you. Again, it's something we'll come back to later. It's only now that we get a good bit with him. Jonathan's saying that he came here for a reason, and someday he's going to need to choose whether he stands proudly in front of the human race or to keep it a secret. And this is good dialogue here. Can I just keep pretending I'm your son? You are my son. 
Just don't save other people's sons, Clark, or else the entire world will change, and that will be bad. But somewhere out there, you... You have another father, too, who gave you another name. Yeah, once more with feeling, we'll come back to this later. Back to the present, Clark has gotten a job at a bar and overhears some Canadian military personnel talking about something weird that was found on Ellesmere Island. By the way, I didn't even realize until the watch-through for this review that apparently Clark is in Canada. The only reason I know that now is because I'm paying close enough attention to the dialogue for the military guy to offhandedly say, the Americans are there too. Yes, the guy has a Canadian flag patch on his uniform, but why would I be paying attention to that instead of his face? My point is that the movie has not done a great job establishing the locations of anything or where Clark is nowadays. It honestly didn't click in my mind that he wasn't in Kansas despite the ocean oil rig in a landlocked state because every Everything looks the goddamn same! I don't know, maybe you could just call me stupid for that. Yet another example of Linkara versus geography, but personally I blame, once again, the gray color palette over everything so different locations aren't distinct. When a waitress gets hit on and groped by a bar patron, Clark steps in to intervene, and the douchebag just pours beer on him and, like, nobody else steps in. No bouncer or even the military guys. We just overhear some laughter as Clark takes it. Clark quits. At least I think he does. He just takes off his apron and leaves. And again, apparently the bartender, nobody else at the bar or anything wants to deal with this asshole. Since Clark leaves in the middle of the day. And we cut to night, where the guy leaves and discovers his truck impaled on some power lines. No one heard that? No one noticed the power disruption? How do you even know which truck was the right one? Hell, what was even the point of the scene? It doesn't lead into a flashback or anything. What thematic point is it trying to make? Don't let assholes tire themselves out failing to beat you up, just destroy their truck and livelihood? I am baffled by this inclusion. I don't even mind that he got some payback on the guy, but the level of overkill on it doesn't make any sense that this wouldn't have attracted so much attention while it was happening. Why not a scene of Clark going over to the trucks, peering into their cabins, finding one that had a picture of the guy in it, then have him slash all his tires or like use his heat vision to weld the doors shut? It's not like this scene comes back again at some point. Lois's investigation shows the waitress, but not the truck stuff. It's just padding in a two hour, 20 minute movie. Anyway, Lois Lane arrives in the film and consequently Ellesmere Island to investigate what happened, meeting with Colonel Hardy, who's in charge of the operation and Professor Emil Hamilton. Naturally, they don't want her there, but because it's Canadian soil, she was able to use the legal system to gain access. They found an object in the ice that has to have been there for almost 20,000 years. Someone switched some scripts and this was actually supposed to be a sequel to the thing. She takes some photos of the area and spots Clark walking along the snowbank. Where the hell are you going? Anywhere? Like, what's so suspicious about this? He could be patrolling the area, searching for something he dropped, or the path down might not be as obvious to see. In any case, Lois decides to follow, discovering a narrow ledge leading to a hole that Clark was able to cut with his heat vision. Also, now that I think about it, why did Clark even decide to come up here? All he overheard was that there was something weird up north that the American military was curious about. Why did that translate in his mind to, say, this is something I should check out? It's almost like he knew it was related to him, especially when he gets inside and the ship detects his presence, bringing up a control console for him to slip the Kryptonian thumb drive into. He's attacked by a security droid or something. Man, Kryptonians made stuff to last 20,000 years ago but pushes in the thumb drive, which gets it to leave him alone. Also, man, apparently Kryptonian weapons can make him bleed? He sees an image of Jor-El and follows, because I guess it can't just talk to him now? The robot attacks Lois and Clark destroys it, but she's injured and he needs to cauterize her wound with his heat vision. We'll forgive that that probably needs more medical treatment than that because Hollywood just kind of treats cauterizing a wound as a cure-all, so that's less this movie's fault. Whatever was on that thumb drive causes the ship to activate and fly out of the ice. Lois is left behind and rescued by the military, writing up a story about it, but Perry White is reluctant to print a story about an alien ship and her being rescued by an alien. As such, she decides to leak it to some blogger first introduced here. Didn't you once describe my site as a creeping cancer of falsehoods? Yeah, best to give it to the person whom you have publicly declared is a liar and cannot be trusted. There is logic in what he says. Because I want my mystery man to know I know the truth. 
Okay, unless this version of Superman has a memory-erasing kiss too, what makes you think he's hoping that you won't know the truth? I guess Clark took the ship farther into the Arctic, but now that he's there, Jor-El decides to introduce himself. To see you standing there having grown into an adult. Only Lara could have witnessed this. But unfortunately, I totally forgot to copy her brain or whatever into that thumb drive. I'm a busy man, and I was probably a more expensive actor than her. He says he uploaded his consciousness, but when the hell did he have time to do that? And as I joked a second ago, if he did have time to do that, why not upload Lara too? And when was he hoping that this would actually happen? Did he know about the Kryptonian ship that's here? How would he know about that, since he only found out what planet they were sending Kal-El right before they launched? He explains to Clark that this is one of thousands of scout ships sent out, but that was 18,000 years ago! Why would he assume any of this still worked? Was he just hoping? that this ship would be there? Or is there a hologram projection system on the ship that brought the baby that was supposed to do this? I mean, obviously they knew about Earth, had data on it, but why wasn't the crashed scout ship ever recovered if they knew it was there? But yeah, he's giving a big exposition dump via CGI sand about Krypton long ago, sending out scout ships, terraforming planets to make colonies, but then for some reason artificial population control was established, the outposts were abandoned, and they ended up running out of natural resources until they mined their own own planet into oblivion. Which wouldn't have been an issue if they could get resources on other planets, dumbasses. There's no reason given for the population control or why they pulled back on space exploration. Especially when Jor-El says their civilization flourished for a hundred thousand years! I don't know when they started doing the population control, but even if they had started that 50,000 years ago, the sheer number of Kryptonians out in the universe should have precluded this from being a viable way of keeping them all on Krypton. People would have left, started out their own governments and worlds, and again, no reason is given for why they felt the need to do this at all! Eventually, our military leader, General Zod, attempted a coup. How do you know that? You went from the coup attempt to the Codex, and then right to your house to launch the baby! There was no time to update the copy of your consciousness if you did this beforehand! If there was time to upload and update your consciousness before the launch, why wasn't Lara put in there too? It just raises too many questions. He explains about how Kryptonian society changed so that every person bred was designed to fulfill a specific role. As a worker, a warrior, a leader, so on. If you hadn't been naturally conceived, they were planning on making you a Roomba repairman. Jor-El and Lara felt that Kryptonians should have the ability to choose their own destiny, hence the natural birth stuff. And yeah, that's admirable, but it doesn't really mean anything to the story. There's no thematic element here that's important by way of him being naturally born. He says he and Lara couldn't come along because they were just as much a product of the failures of their world, but he still uploaded his consciousness, so he is still technically alive in some form. And even if you pretend this is just like an artificial intelligence that has access to the memories, he and Lara were the ones who wanted to break the tradition! They were already thinking and imagining outside of what they were programmed to be from birth. They were violating rules and choosing their own destiny, meaning that they could very well have continued on and actually been able to raise their son and not just hope the locals looked like them enough and that they'd be empathetic to a baby and raise him! He could have landed on Earth and gotten eaten by a bear or something by accident! This is why in a lot of versions versions of this story, the ship is more like a prototype, or just like a last desperate plan to get Kal-El to safety before everything goes to hell. Because the alternative is that they could have saved themselves, but nah, just kind of accept death boringly like Lara did. You win some, you lose some, right? Jor-El says that Clark can embody the best of both Earth and Krypton, which he hasn't really done a good job of selling whatever Krypton's positive points have been, and then... He unveils the Superman suit to him. Where did this come from? Did the scout ship make it? Did it scan Clark to get his measurements right? Why would a scout ship have a clothing fabricator on it? Was it for the dead Kryptonian we saw earlier? And why would Jor-El have a suit ready for him at all? Why was that a priority? Was this, again, dependent on there being a scout ship on the planet they landed on? Or did the ship Kal-El was sent out on have a clothing device too? What would have happened if he had first talked to him as a 10-year-old? Would he still have given him a little 10-year-old Superman suit? Does it expand to fit him when his body changes? Or would he have had to keep making new suits? Why is it red and blue when everyone else's clothes on Krypton are brown, black, gray, and gold. And you know what really bugs me? When you break it down, 
This isn't actually any different than how it happened in the Christopher Reeve film. Seriously, Clark takes a crystal or whatever into the Arctic, talks to a hologram of his dad that answers all of his questions while encouraging him to uplift humanity and be a good person, and then a Superman suit is just magically provided for him. The differences are all in the presentation, though. Why one works and the other just keeps making my brain run around in circles trying to think of justifications or explanations for what seem to be contradictions. For one thing, the Reeve film was made in 1978, in the middle of the Bronze Age of comics, but the movie was definitely trying to follow a more gold or silver age logic to it. More kind of magical thinking, kind of a more ethereal or mythical way of presenting the material. Sure, once he becomes Superman, the film strives for a bit more realism, but the scene with Jor-El in the Fortress of Solitude is more like being given a mission from God. This is aided by a musical score that highlights the wonder of it all, cosmic visuals and a montage of various phrases Jor-El speaks to indicate a passage of time, lessons for how Clark should lead his life, and then him triumphantly having the suit and flying off, the music once again showing this as a glorious moment. In Man of Steel, it's a massive exposition dump about Krypton's history, trying to explain why there's a ship here, why there's a hologram of Jor-El, why him being a natural birth is in any way special, who General Zod is, why they didn't come along, and the music is just droning wallpaper sound. It's in the background, but you don't really notice it unless you're listening for it. His crappy theme music comes back in as he walks out, and you think, maybe this is that same moment of triumph, but nope. Jarrell just keeps laying on the exposition about why his powers work the way they do as he walks out onto the snow. And I've already expressed how much this Superman theme sucks. It doesn't help matters that the washed out colors make Superman's blues look like black in some shots. Like, just take a look at this bit with Superman in front of the sun. We are literally seeing him in broad daylight, and he looks more like he's a silhouette with how much shadow is on him. It's Superman! On a field of bright white all around him! He could be the most colorful thing here, but no! I'm pretty sure the mountains and sky have more blue on them. And don't tell me he'd have heavy shadows from that angle. They could have filmed this any way they wanted, and they deliberately did it like this. Visuals are what Zack Snyder is most known for in terms of the cinematography of his films. It was a deliberate choice to be this shadowed. If you've lasted through all that lengthy complaining and rambling, then I think it's time I talk about something I actually like. The flight scene. Now, I can nitpick here. For one, while I'm okay with him leaping to start with, the presentation doesn't make it seem like Superman is struggling to learn how to fly. It's just special effects slamming down hard into the snow and ice without us getting a chance to really absorb what this means for him. For another, Wow, why did it take so long for him to find out he could fly? But in a movie that's been so otherwise dour and joyless, the sheer glee on his face when he's actually able to fly, and Jor-El talks about how humanity will join him in the sky, that is Superman. It's good stuff. Henry Cavill is not a bad Superman. When they let him be Superman, I actually have less of a problem. The theatrical cut of Justice League gets a lot of flack. And rightfully so for many reasons, both behind the scenes and what made it on screen. But honestly, that is the version of Superman I want. Dying was the best thing that ever happened to Clark. Gave him a better sense of humor, at least. But yeah, Superman flying like this and finding happiness in that, it's awesome. Music still isn't that great, but it's trying. Meanwhile, we get another thing I kind of like. Lois showing off her journalistic skills to track down Clark. Or rather, figuring out that it's probably Clark Kent who was the one who saved her, retracing the steps of all the places we've seen him. Now, the reason I say kind of like is that I feel like Clark Kent, as his own person who's a reporter and has his own life versus just kind of drifting and aimless, should be established first. But at the same time, it shows off how good she is at her job and connects the disparate elements we've seen so that stuff like Clark saving the oil rig isn't just padding. Lois goes to talk to Martha, but whatever they said to each other isn't shown, instead just having her finally meet up with Clark over Jonathan's grave. She says that she wants to tell his story and that it's going to come out eventually, or that someone will do what she did and track him down. Clark says he can just disappear again. The only way you could disappear for good is to stop helping people altogether, and I sense that's not an option for you. You know, the complaint that people kept telling me on Twitter that they had about this movie was that Superman didn't want to help people, that he needed Jor-El to go tell him to be Superman. 
But that's not it at all. He's been Superman since he was a little kid, always trying to use his powers to help people. He saved the kids, saved the people on the oil rig, stepped in to try to confront the drug and trucker, saved Lois. jor just gave him new clothes and told him to think bigger. But therein lies another problem. He's just kind of naturally Superman, that he doesn't learn anything. He's just a good person instinctively, and his parents play no real part in anything he does. And as Clark replies, Jonathan Kent actually believed that the world would reject his help if he ever revealed himself. And that leads us to another flashback. And another really terrible scene. And what a dink! It revolves around Jonathan Kent again. Hey, remember that great moment when Jonathan tearfully proclaimed to Clark that he was his son? Yeah, well, Clark doesn't want to become a farmer like him and proclaims that they're not his real parents. They just found him in a field. And how does Jonathan follow up? He's right. Clark has a point. We're not your parents. Fuck off. Clark starts to apologize. And what's funny is that I'd actually be okay if it was just Clark saying it. You know, moment of anger underscores the tragedy that's about to happen. But having Jonathan Kent say it too? Go to hell, movie. Go to hell and wallow in fiery piss. And I know, some will say he was just trying to exaggerate or be sarcastic or some other bull. That he does see him as his son. And maybe he does. But that's not a thing you say to your son! Especially your adopted son, who feels like an other and an outsider! It just has this kind of iffy and skeevy undertone about it. Especially when Jor-El is glorifying natural birth and talking about how it was so important to have babies that way. Thus the natural way of doing things. And thus, since Jonathan and Martha weren't the ones to give birth to Clark, that somehow they are not as valid as his birth parents. Sure, probably wasn't the intention by the filmmakers, but it's what it comes across as. Anyway, before they can make up, a tornado forms up in front of the cars on the road. Jonathan stays behind to help people get out of their cars into an overpass. Safety tip, by the way, do not do this. Overpasses are, in fact, one of the worst places you can seek shelter in during a tornado for various reasons. This is another one I don't blame the movie for. It's a common misconception, just letting you all know. Jonathan goes back to the car to retrieve their dog, but his leg briefly gets pinned under a car that fell on his. The car gets blown off and he starts to limp away, Clark wanting to go run and get him. However, Jonathan holds out his hand to indicate he shouldn't do it. This scene. This frickin' scene. Look, I'm not the biggest fan of killing Jonathan Kent. I like scenes of Clark going back to the farm and consulting with his parents. It's wholesome and highlights the positive influence of said parents. But there's a reason why Superman stories come back to it time and again. Superman, for all his powers and abilities, is not a god. He cannot fix everything. That's why media will have Jonathan Kent die of a heart attack or the like. It's something completely outside of Clark's control. It's an important lesson he should learn. And hey, dying from a tornado? That's not bad either. The heart attack works better because that's especially something he can't do anything about. But a force of nature like that can also get the same point across. The problem though is in the presentation of it. And this is the worst display of it I've ever seen. 16 seconds. It takes 16 seconds between Jonathan holding out his hand to stop Clark and then getting overtaken by the edge of the tornado. Which wouldn't necessarily kill him right away, but we'll give it the benefit of the doubt and say his hit points were instantly depleted in that moment. That is more than enough time for him to run over, grab Jonathan, and run back. Maybe even without using his superpowers. He's not that far away. Hell, Jonathan can clearly see Clark's intention despite everything else going on, so he must be pretty close to be able to tell that. This version of Jonathan Kent is so paranoid about Clark exposing his powers, he can't even fathom the idea of rescuing him without him using them. Even if he was that far away, he could run fast enough without it even looking like super speed. It's not impossible. Look, if Clark rescued a bus full of children years ago and nobody was digging deeper into it until Lois, then him running over and bringing you back in a high stress situation like a 
freaking tornado when everyone's panicking and can't be certain of anything happening isn't gonna be a problem. I think Jonathan was just so bored of this movie that he finally found a way out and decided to take it. Oh, and good job. Have your son watch as you die, dude. Make him good and traumatized. And he looks so indifferent to his own death here, too. Do you have an appropriate reaction to anything? My boat. Of course. Behold the ethical values Jonathan Kent instilled in his child. Never use your power at all to help people. Exposing your abilities to anyone else is a worse thing than letting people, including loved ones, die. This version of Jonathan Kent has instilled a different set of ethics in Clark. Paranoia. Distrust. Selfishness. It's amazing how off the mark this is about Superman's character. That's the entire point of his backstory. That he was raised by two good people who brought about the best in him by being shining examples of humanity themselves. But no, so far it's just been Clark naturally wanting to do good. But then his parents are like, you stop trying to be a good person and let people suffer and die, mister. Your personal safety by staying a secret is more important than the lives of innocents. And it's continued on in Batman v Superman when his mom is like, you don't know people anything. Don't bother going out to help people, especially if they're mean to you and want accountability. And then Ghost Dad shows up later to be all, helping people makes things worse. This movie keeps desperately trying to turn him into Superman, but he's held back by his dad telling him, stop being a good person and be selfish, damn it. You are a fool to help people. Which, by the way, is also the opinion of the villains! Yeah, 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 he's a father who loves his son and is just being super overprotective of him. Well, maybe that means he's a bad father, which Jonathan Kent shouldn't be! I let my father die because he was convinced that I had to wait. You're 33 years old at this point! How much longer are you supposed to wait? Lois decides out of concern for him to drop the story. When she returns to the Daily Planet, she's read the riot act by Perry White for leaking the story to the blogger, but since she's so accepting of dropping it, he recognizes that she saw something that's convinced her to do this, and also agrees with the sentiment that people would react negatively to the news of a super powerful being among them. Which really goes to show how much this movie came out in the New 52 era of DC, where nobody trusts or respects anyone else, so hey, at least it reflects the comic that way. I actually do like this stuff with Lois because it's more about character development, showing the kind of person she is. Unlike in, say, Heroes in Crisis, where Lois is all like, I will share the truth and news even if it's potentially harmful to people. This version of Lois actually has a sense of right and wrong and doesn't want her stories to hurt innocent people. And you know, actually, that kind of would have been an okay reinterpretation of the mythos. Have Lois be Clark's moral center that convinces him to do the right thing instead of his father. But then maybe we shouldn't spend as much time with him. Clark heads home, and I just noticed an annoying thing with the cinematography, which is also something I don't blame on the movie itself, but rather how a lot of stuff is shot nowadays. All the unnecessary shaky cam. Like, here's a distant shot of Clark and Martha hugging, but they can't keep the camera from shaking. I love how the steady cam was a revolutionary piece of camera technology, and decades later, a lot of directors decided to get rid of them, ostensibly to make things more real, when in reality, most people aren't just rapidly moving their heads around at any given moment. Clark visits his mom, and once more, it's nice to see him smiling as he tells her he found out about his past. Martha happy for him, but afraid people will find out about him and take him away. Same ol', same ol'. Anyway, over to NORAD, where General Swanwick is being informed by Professor Hamilton that something is approaching Earth. What am I looking at, Doc? Comet? Asteroid? Comets don't make course corrections. Well, you guys are in NORAD, which is based in the Cheyenne Mountain Complex, along with the Stargate. You sure this isn't a Goa'uld mothership? Actually, from the photos, it kind of looks like Nero's ship from Star Trek 2009. Guess that last red matter black hole sent him even farther back in time. Communication attempts have failed, though I'm curious why General Swanwick is being told about this first instead of, you know the president, and why communications were attempted before they told him. Like, what would they have done if they answered? No offense, Toby, but you were the communications director on the West Wing, not here. And even there, I don't think you had the authority to make first contact. But I think whoever's at the helm of that thing is looking to make a dramatic entrance. PRESENTATION! The ship soon makes its entrance and... 
I guess, cuts the power in the entire world, save for TVs and phones? How did they do that? You are not a star, no. We are not a Yes, face of Bo, we get it! You can knock it off now! General Zod speaks, and I guess we now truly see how sucky Kryptonians are with basic camera technology. They can't just transmit a regular message, no, no. We can only see the vague shape of his head in a helmet. Why did this need to come in the form of video distortion like it was a friggin' To The Ark video from Marble Hornets? It's especially weird because despite the weird surreal visuals and constant you are not alone repetition, the audio comes out just fine. Zod speaks clearly, says that he's there for one of his citizens that's been hiding among them, and he wants said citizen returned. And that's fine, he should have his message be clear. But why is the audio so crisp, yet the audio looks like a severely broken GIF? He gives Kal-El 24 hours to surrender, or he'll destroy Earth. The blogger reveals that Lois knows who it is that they're looking for, and the FBI quickly grabs her. We start going into the infamous church scene, and... Then we don't. Like, I don't even remember this, but instead it's another flashback to Clark's childhood where some bullies want to beat up Clark, he resists the urge to fight back, and his dad praises him for not doing so. That in the future, he needs to figure out what kind of man he wants to be in all. Why is this scene here? Wouldn't this have been more appropriate to put right after the scene with Clark destroying the truck? Like, this is not a good metaphor for what's happening with Zod's threat right now. And don't think I didn't notice yet another fairly crappy life lesson from you, Jonathan. While every situation is different, sometimes it is the appropriate decision to fight back against a bully. Because bullies will continue to prey on you if they think they can get away with it. There's nothing of good character about taking abuse. Anyway, the church scene. It's not a scene that doomed this movie for me. But man, is it so weird. Clark goes to this priest that we've never seen before and explains that he's the one Zod is looking for and says that he doesn't think Zod can be trusted, but that he doesn't know if humanity can be either. And then before the priest can answer, he gets up and starts walking away. The priest has to call out and tell him that he should take a leap of faith first and get the trust later. It's surface level analogy of Superman as Jesus, which... By the way, someone needs to do a deep dive video essay at some point, exploring how that analogy is dumb any time it comes up. But more than that, it's just such a bad scene for the movie. Again, we've never seen this priest before! Maybe if he had been established beforehand, a, a flashback earlier to Clark's childhood, showing him seeking some solace as a kid as he's discovering his powers or something and he's comforted by him, which, you know, is the kind of thing that should be done by his parents, but we've seen how well that goes. But yeah, it's only a minute long, and Priest McNobody is suddenly the guy that gives him the advice to make his decision? Why wasn't this his mom? Or Lois? Or hell, even Pete Ross! We saw him as an adult earlier working at IHOP. Why not make the priest an adult Pete Ross and Clark turns to him for advice? The flashback with the bullies showed Pete helping Clark up, so they clearly became friends after he saved his life. You can still have your stupid Jesus metaphor and have the character's presence make sense. Was this the last thing they shot and they just didn't have anybody else available? Or they had to replace the actor at the last minute, like in the room when the actor for Peter the Psychologist had to leave and his lines later just went to some rando we hadn't seen before? But yeah, Clark, now in the Superman outfit, just shows up in a desert somewhere, and the military surround him. I guess it's at a military base, but we don't see that it's a base until a wide shot shows some fences. Otherwise, General Swanwick just says, You got our attention. And it looks like he just flew out to the middle of the desert and floated there until somebody noticed. Clark wants to see Lois, not that we're ever privy to how he knows they have Lois, or that she's at this particular base or anything. But yeah, he surrenders to them and is brought to the very green hallways of this base. Hey, when I started doing my show, the shots looked very yellow. Just a result of the default white balance. Nowadays, the default actually looks better because of different lighting in this place, but I still adjust it with RGB curves. I bring this up because every time I see a shot like this in the movie, I want to take the movie into Adobe Premiere to try to fix it. Why does this shot look like this? It's like they're filming it through a Listerine bottle. I posted this on Twitter, and there's actually some disagreement about why it looks this way, because the version on HBO Max doesn't look like this, and another one looked even better. I mean, it still was tinted a bit, but it looked better than this. My version is a Blu-ray copy I got from someone else, so maybe it's just a result of the encoding, but it just looks so weird. 
If this was how it looked theatrically, I can't remember. It was nine years ago. Just, I don't get it. Why was it this green? No other interiors in this movie look like this. How does it enhance the mood? What was the reasoning behind it? I mean, in the grand scheme of things, it doesn't matter. It's a nitpick, but it's just, I don't get it. Anyway, he's brought inside to see Lois per his request. He tells Lois he's not surrendering to Zod, but rather to mankind, letting them decide what to do with him. She asks what the S stands for on his outfit. On my world, it means hope. Well, here it's an S. Well, Lois, on another planet, this means peace among worlds. You can take it to mean whatever you want on this one. I get it, she's supposed to name him Superman here, but that's really a dick thing to do. Basically say, oh, the symbol from your culture looks like something else, so we'll completely change its meaning and give you a new name. She's interrupted before saying Superman by Professor Hamilton, but Superman says he can see him through the glass as well as all the soldiers. He says the guards aren't necessary. So you, you, you can't expect us to not take precautions. You could be carrying some kind of alien pathogen. And those pathogens might be armed! Superman says that they're afraid of him because they can't control him. But that doesn't make him their enemy. Then who is... Zod? Well, he is the one who threatened to destroy humanity, whereas you didn't even know Superman existed until last night, and he voluntarily surrendered himself to you, so who knows, eh? He's been ordered to surrender Superman over to Zod. Supes thanks Lois for believing in him, and it's a good moment. Zod's forces arrive wearing protective suits. In my original vlog, I identified them as Ursa and Nan, and of course, that is not correct. They're actually Feora Ol and Nam Ek, the former actually being an adaptation of a Silver Age Superman Kryptonian villainess. But I think you can forgive me for making that mistake because they're basically playing the same roles. Feora in the original comics is a misandrist and had brown hair, whereas visually here she looks much more like Ursa. Nam Ek is an original for the movie, but is a silent big brute just like Nan. And since both end up having a big fight with Supes later, they may have drawn a bit from the comics in terms of Kryptonian characters, but I'm pretty sure they were trying to evoke the villains from Superman 2. Anyway, she greets him and then says they want Lois to come as well. Both General Swanwick and Colonel Hardy, who is here now, I guess, refuse, but she agrees to come along. And the reason they bring her is because... someone needs to save Superman in the next part of the movie. Yeah, I have no idea why they bring her, or how they even know who she is. Their shuttle flies off to meet with Zod's ship. So, do you guys just not believe in chairs? Soups hands Lois the USB crystal. Why he does this, or why he thought to bring it along is never explained, but whatever. Lois is also given a CGI helmet of her own, so she can breathe in the Kryptonian atmosphere of the ship. They meet Zod, but after a lifetime of the atmosphere of Earth, Clark isn't exactly taking to the Kryptonian version either, and collapses. This leads to some kind of weird Matrix vision thing, where Zod speaks to Superman in his mind. Zod explains that the somatic reconditioning was the Phantom Zone. Not that Clark knows what the hell that is. The destruction of our world freed us. That one software engineer thought it was just a funny gag when he programmed the Phantom Zone to open when Krypton exploded. But who's laughing now, huh? He explains that they retrofitted the Phantom Zone projectors into a hyperdrive that they use to look at old Kryptonian colonies. And apparently without the support of Krypton itself, the colonies all withered and died. So I guess that answers one of my questions from jor exposition dump, but still, dick move on the Kryptonians' part to suddenly decide, yeah, you're on your own, guys, don't bother coming back. Jeez. They salvaged what they could from the outposts, including weapons and a terraforming device called a World Engine, and have basically been bumming around for 33 years. Kryptonians must live longer lifespans in general, since none of them look much older. When Clark activated the scout ship, it sent out a distress beacon that they followed to Earth. They say that that genetic codex from the start is stored on the ship that brought Clark to Earth, so now they need that to help turn Earth into the new Krypton. Of course, this will mean the destruction of all life on Earth, as demonstrated by this ocean of skulls that Superman starts sinking into. Are we the baddies? Some have wondered why they can't just terraform Mars or something, but let's face it, Zod's already about genetic purity and crap. He's probably not going to be happy that the the filthy humans or his neighbors. Or he's just lazy. We're already here, Feora. Do you really want to take another hour to get to Mars? 
Clark comes out of the Matrix to find he's strapped to a table. Zod admits that he killed Jor-El, but it seems 33 years have softened him a bit on Jor-El, admitting that he's sad that he did it and actually had immense respect for the dude, but he has a duty to save his people. I like this. We don't need extra dimensions for the space Nazi, but they can help make a villain more compelling. Lois is shoved in a cell because they realize they had no reason to bring her, but what a coinky dink! It just so happens to have a computer interface for the crystal. She uses it in the Jor-El hologram appears, saying that he can modify the ship's atmosphere to Earth standard and, with Lois's help, send the villains back to the Phantom Zone. And this... This is why we spent so much friggin' time with Krypton at the beginning, and the point I've been saying we'll come back to. Jor-El has more screen time than Jonathan Kent, and is the one who's actually been the good father to him. Because Superman's Kryptonian heritage is more important to the character in this version than his human upbringing. Part of the problem here is a different mindset about Superman as a character, both in the comics and in the minds of some of his fans. To some fans, Superman is Kal-El first. His Kryptonian heritage and his parents from that world are more important because of what they did, sending him off from a doomed planet in the hopes of having a better life elsewhere. And thus, it's only natural that Jor-El plays a big part in these proceedings. It's the attitude that the Silver Age seemed to have about him at times. Superman was his true identity, he had lots of Kryptonian tech, and knew tons and tons of stuff about his original homeworld and the people there, and really Earth felt more like a place he was living abroad in versus it being his true adopted home. When the world finds out what you can do, it's going to change everything. Our, our beliefs, our notions of what it means to be human, everything. That's another way of saying that it's not from this world, Clark. And neither are you. But somewhere out there, you... You have another father, too, who gave you another name. However, as time went on, particularly with modern reinterpretations of the character, we come to my preferred outlook of the guy. Jonathan Kent is the more important father figure in his life. Jonathan Kent raised him, instilled him with his morals, embraced humanity and compassion in Earth. Earth is his home. Clark Kent is who he is. Superman is a tool he uses to help people. But the guy who was raised on a farm is the person he is and his true heritage. Krypton is not even a memory. Memory for him. It's some ancestral homeland that he will forever be distant from. Intentional or not, this movie basically takes the attitude that Clark is forever separate from humanity. They are distrustful of him. His adopted father gives him advice that keeps him separate. His Kryptonian father comes to his rescue in this scene. He only becomes Superman to the public to deal with Kryptonian stuff. He becomes really happy after he learns of and talks about his Kryptonian heritage. This movie is less about Superman showing humanity how great it can be, and more about how he needs to reject and stop the old Kryptonian ways. Instead of Man of Steel, this movie probably should have been called Last Son of Krypton. But hey, maybe that's just me reading too much into the movie. But if this isn't the correct reading, then why the hell is Jor-El still here and playing a very active part in this sequence? The most important part of Jor-El in Superman's story is sending his son off. That's it. And maybe it's just they wanted to get more out of Russell Crowe, but then you could have just had him as a big floating hologram head giving some advice to Lois on what she can do instead of a full body walking around with her. And don't say it's to save on special effects when they have people running around in CGI helmets when they could have just had people in actual helmets. Anyway, with the atmosphere restored, Superman is able to escape and Lois is brought to an escape pod to get away. It's damaged on the way out and Jor-El shows that to Clark, explaining that he wanted him to live as a human first and then act as a bridge between the two peoples before learning of the genetic codex and stuff. You can save her, Cal. You can save all of them. T-Pose to save humanity. Also, really? Really? You can save them all, and then put him in the Jesus pose! Oh, get off the cross, we need the wood. He does indeed rescue her while the Kryptonians arrive at the Kent farm to grab the ship, apparently possessing powers and already knowing how to use them. I only bring this up because the movie has made such a big deal about all the environmental factors that gave Clark powers and not just the sun. And even then, they're all wearing these spacesuits designed to cover them from head to toe, occasionally with CGI to make the helmets transparent, and... I don't know, it just feels like they don't absorb enough sunlight after only a minute or so to be on par with soups, but I guess they are. Feora can't find the codex in the ship, so Zod threatens Martha, 
and gets tackled into town by Superman, who screams that he won't let him hurt his mother. This does a lot of collateral damage right from the get-go, even blowing up a gas station and probably killing or injuring anyone there. But hey, we don't see anything, so we can probably assume it's okay? Now, I will be a little more forgiving of this sequence than most people have. Clark is inexperienced. He's pissed off. He's worried about his mom. It's understandable that he wasn't thinking when he ended up bringing the fight to Smallville. It's just everything after this part that's an issue. Zod's spacesuit gets damaged and thus is exposed to Earth's atmosphere. And I guess sunlight only gives the flight and super strength. The air is what gives him the advanced hearing and x-ray vision. And as I said whenever ago, why didn't Clark have that since he was a baby then? My parents taught me to hone my senses on. Focus on just what I wanted to see. Let me just tell you what I did to counter this, assuming you won't be able to do the same. Wow, I'm not very smart, am I? The other Kryptonians arrive and grab Zod, Feora and Namek staying behind to fight him. Now, seeing all this damage and destruction and all the people fleeing, Clark should be trying to take the fight elsewhere. But instead, he tells the people, get inside, it's not safe. He fully intends to fight them here. Oh, and then the military shows up to make things worse, firing at all three of them in the middle of the street without regard for civilians in the area. I'm the government, I'm the government. I'm the reason nothing works. Since I'm not really giving a play-by-play -play of the fight, here's another annoying cinematography thing. Science fiction really needs to stop trying to emulate the Battlestar Galactica reboot in mood and character dynamics, and especially in cinematography. Because three times now in this film, we've had a shot of CGI ships or aircraft, and it's always distant shot shaky cam, then quick zoom in on the craft and refocus. Battlestar Galactica used to do that shot all the damn time, and frankly, I've grown really tired of it. It stopped being gritty or realistic or whatever buzzword you want to use, and is now just shorthand for, we can't think of anything interesting to do with these shots, and think just following them is too boring. Anyway, Superman tackles Feora into the IHOP. The fact that you possess a sense of morality, and we do not, gives us an evolutionary advantage. And as we all know, loyalty to your leader, believing in restoring your people to life, and camaraderie with your fellow troops has nothing to do with morality. God, you might as well have just quoted Dark Helmet. Now you see that evil will always triumph, because good is dumb. And if history has proven anything, it is that evolution always wins. Aren't you people genetically engineered? Like, you completely bypassed evolution, and you're all grown with specific traits chosen for you instead of acquiring traits to better suit your environment. The one thing I'll grant this fight is that while far too many shots are just quick, high-impact, send people flying for a bit kind of shots, we do finally have a proper Superman brawl. It's not perfect, but it's superpowered beings hitting each other. We can see the action and mostly follow it. The fights in the original Reeve movies were... Not great. The fighting wasn't really the point of them, after all, but when the fight with Nuclear Man is one of the better fight scenes in the series, you know something's wrong. Oh, another good moment. Superman rescuing a soldier and then asking if he's okay. Ugh, I feel dirty giving any praise to this film. What's something else I can complain about? Ooh, the heat vision. I hate the way his heat vision is portrayed in these movies. This overpowered, massive blasts of energy that look like they're designed to blow up mountains. It just makes Superman look scary. And you should not be making the pinnacle of goodness and charm and likability and all the best traits of humanity look frightening. The idea, like all the super fast kind of movements and everything they have him do, is probably to emphasize how powerful he really is but it comes across like overcompensating. Like we couldn't believe his heat vision was that impressive without it being that destructive. Anyway, the two get picked up by Zod's forces and retreat. After Soups checks in on Martha and says that he thinks that bringing back the Kryptonians with the Codex might be bad because they wouldn't be interested in sharing Earth, Lois arrives and says she knows how to stop them, thanks to Jor-El telling her. However, on Zod's ship, they've discovered the Codex is infused in Clark's cells because science, so they intend to just terraform Earth, kill him, and do their thing. The world engine is dispatched in two segments, one in the South Indian Ocean, the other in Metropolis. Okay, they're supposed to be on the exact opposite sides of the planet, so I I hope someone actually took the time to look at, like, the maps on the military base or whatever and pinpoint exactly where Metropolis is supposed to be in this universe. 
The devices are activated, which apparently involves lifting everything in the immediate area and then slamming it back down again. Colonel Hardy brings Superman and Lois back to the military base and informs the general of the plan. The ship Kal-El arrived in uses the same kind of engine that Zod's ship does, which is the same space warping tech as the Phantom Zone. If both engines are active at once, which Zod's currently is for the world engine, they'll collide and create a singularity that will suck all the Kryptonians in. Why this would specifically suck in the Kryptonians and no one else and how they close it once it's done is not explained, but apparently it's a viable plan according to Colonel Hardy. And if you can't trust the guy created specifically for this movie because, I don't know, I guess Christopher Maloney was available that day, then who can you trust? Superman flies off to deal with the terraforming device on the Indian Ocean, while the military goes to deal with the one in Metropolis. Also, I guess the militaries for countries bordering the Indian Ocean are all on vacation or something. Anyway, enjoy this shot of screaming people being flung into the air and then back down again. <laughs> I can't tell if that was intended to be comedic or just dark, but either way, why? Zod heads to the scout ship to retrieve the Genesis Chamber that will be necessary for creating the new Kryptonian population. He also takes a moment to acclimate to Earth's atmosphere, which... Yeah, he seems to do pretty quickly, given Clark had his entire life, whereas Zod has had, like... Five minutes, but whatever gets the plot moving closer to the end. His command key overrides Jor-El's in there, and that's the end of Jor-El, I guess. Superman, meanwhile, fights some CGI sand tentacles that apparently this one has to guard it, but not the one in Metropolis. Still, things are not much better there, as the gravity field generated by the device repels their missiles, and the fighters themselves end up crashing and doing just as much damage to the area. This leads to a scene of Perry White rescuing someone in the rubble, but it's... Not really anything, so I'm just gonna skip it in the recap. I mean, maybe if they were inspired by Superman's example to prove the point about him, but... Nope, it's just tension building for someone we've barely met before in this film. Yeah, yeah, we care because it's Perry White, an established Superman supporting character, but that feels kind of cheap when he otherwise hasn't been a big presence in the film before. The Jor-El hologram tells Zod that humanity and the Kryptonians can coexist. So we can suffer through years of pain trying to adapt like your son has? They're genetically engineered anyway! You can modify them to breathe Earth's atmosphere! And you seem to adapt pretty quick even without that. Hell, why would you want to get rid of that atmosphere anyway when it gives you more superpowers? The Jor-El hologram is deleted and it looks like all hope is lost, but Superman manages to rise through the energy blast of the terraforming device and destroy it. If the music was better, it'd be a real awe-inspiring fist pump in the air moment. Top tier Superman stuff. But the droning noise just does nothing for me. Six out of 10. Superman's naturally out for a bit after a maneuver like that, but fortunately the sun hits him and rejuvenates him. Unfortunately, I have to tilt my head and remember that it's the middle of the day in Metropolis as well, so that means the sun is hitting the two complete opposite sides of the planet at once. Space is warped and time is bendable. For some reason, the USB crystal won't go into the ship, so they can't activate the engine. Zod's forces start attacking the planes with the recovered scout ship, but Superman arrives to stop him and destroy it. Zod warns him that if he destroys the ship, he destroys Krypton because of the Genesis Chamber on it, but Superman says that Krypton had its chance and destroys it. Now, some have criticized this as Superman committing genocide or murdering Kryptonian babies in the Genesis Chamber, but no, there's no dialogue to indicate that the chamber actually had any life inside of it. It's more like destroying a big egg incubator that wasn't occupied. Without the codex, it's just a bunch of water and balls. Professor Hamilton realizes that the crystal wasn't going in because the top of the ship was misaligned, which I feel is a metaphor for the frustrations of IT personnel across the world trying to provide customer service over the phone and fixes it, allowing the crystal to enter and activate the engine. Feora flies in to try to stop them, chasing after Colonel Hardy because, for some reason, they have some sort of weird rivalry, I guess. Hamilton activates the crystal and they crash into the ship, all the Kryptonian stuff getting sucked in. Lois somehow does not crash with everyone else and just falls, Soup saving her again. The portal closes, all the evil Kryptonians getting sucked into it. It certainly does suck. Perry White and some Daily Planet personnel walk out as they see Superman and Lois start kissing, even though they've known each other for, like, a day. He saved us. Okay, that line has been rightfully mocked time and again because... Well, she's saying this while they're in the massive crater that was Metropolis, which is, of course, magically repaired in two years for Batman v Superman. But here's my question. 
if we take this at face value, how does she know that? She spent the last few minutes stuck under debris, and he was pretty far away while the ship got destroyed. And she's never seen him before. How does she know who he is? How does she know he did anything? I guess she's just assuming since he saved Lois and didn't get sucked into the portal, but still. You know they say it's all downhill after the first kiss. <laughs> That's true, this movie does go downhill after this moment. And it wasn't exactly starting very high to begin with. Zod is alive, and naturally, he is pissed. And yeah, at this point, Superman should really try to bring the fight elsewhere, especially as he knows all the destruction that can still be wrought. But nope. Gasoline truck sent at him? Just dodge over it so it can explode and send more buildings toppling. Grab Zod and fly him away from the city? Nope, keep trying to punch him. Try to keep the fight in the air away from people? Nah, punch him into as much as you can, even though you know it won't hurt him. Don't try to taunt him to make him follow you away from people. I know, Zod is the one mostly responsible for this, but there keep being opportunities for him to take the fight elsewhere. Zod first learning to fly, them going into space, and then finally them falling into a building with people in it, and he grabs Zod and just holds him which gives Zod the idea to activate his heat vision to threaten some innocent people. And this leads to... the final moment. The thing that made this movie irredeemable in my eyes. Superman pleads with Zod not to do this. Zod refuses to stop. And Superman snaps his neck. This scene, in Superman's action right here, this is what finally killed the film for me. Killed any interest I may have had in further DC projects set in this universe or with this Superman. The rest of the film sucked, but in a, ugh, whatever, move on kind of way. But this... This is what made me hate the movie. Superman is supposed to be better than us. And even this movie told us that Superman is meant to be something better the light to guide humanity to something better. And a Superman that kills most certainly is not any of that. In Infinite Crisis, the modern Superman told his Earth-2 counterpart that his world couldn't be perfect, because a perfect world doesn't need a Superman. And I say that our world doesn't need a Superman that kills, because it makes the world that much worse. In my opinion, and you can disagree with me, but I'm gonna keep saying it because it's my show, Superman should never, ever, ever, ever kill. Ever. And I know that some of you are just lining up in the comments. But wait! What about this comic story where he does kill or is okay with it? Or he killed in this comic, but he felt really bad about it. Those few times when in modern comics, Superman has taken a life. Citing them as some sort of, but it's comic accurate, Linkara, kind of things. And to that I say... Batman hates rock and roll, except he's also a big fan of The Clash. Wonder Woman worked at a Taco Bell for a while, but didn't know how to pump gas. Ted Kord was a money-grubbing jokester, always making get-rich-quick schemes. And also, he was a serious crime fighter and a genius that allowed him to be a multi-millionaire with his company. Sometimes, what's in the comic books isn't consistent, and different writers do different stupid things, and sometimes, comic writers are just plain wrong. I mean, I'd really hope after me doing this show for 14 years, you'd recognize that. This scene is wrong. This is offensive to me as a Superman fan. This scene is why I hate this movie more than Batman v Superman. All the other stuff was bad. It would have made this just a bad movie already. But this was where I decided that the DC Cinematic Universe would never, ever be anything close to what it could be. Because it starts with the greatest superhero of all time, taking a life. So then, the big question that gets trotted out. What else could Superman have done then? Zod said he'd never stop. He had to do something, right? Well, first of all, Superman's not real. He is a fictional character. So what else could he have done? Whatever the frickin' writer decided he could do. Or not even create that situation to begin with. But, as a writer myself, if you really want some alternatives... Da-da-da-da-da-da! -da 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 -da. 
Turn Zod's head up towards the sky and keep it there until he ran out of steam. Fly Zod up and away from the people. He has plenty of time while holding him to do that. Superman puts himself in the path of the heat vision, even if just his hand. Use his leg to kick Zod in such a way as to disorient him. Use his own heat vision on the top of Zod's head to disorient and distract him. Use his freezing breath on Zod's head. Admittedly, with this one, I don't think they ever established this version of Superman had the freezing breath, but hey, this is your chance to establish it and stop Zod. Don't have the sequence at all. The climax was the destruction of the ship, Zod either died in the crash or was sucked into the black hole with his forces, end the movie 10 minutes early, and it probably saved you tens of thousands of dollars on all those additional effects shots. Or, in my opinion, the best one, turn Zod's head down at himself. Zod refuses to stop firing. Zod kills himself instead of Superman killing him. Split hairs, perhaps, but Zod could stop shooting the heat vision at any time. So that way, I say Zod is more responsible than Superman. And if you think that in any of these scenarios, Superman wouldn't be able to move his neck, then by that logic, he shouldn't be able to snap it either. Yeah, I know. Some of those are not permanent solutions, but at the very least, he could be worn out eventually and... I don't know, there's a Phantom Zone projector or something in the crashed scout ship, whatever. As I said, a writer can come up with any other solution than killing. Why did Superman kill Zod? Because they wanted to have Superman kill his enemy and maybe feel bad about it. That's it. God, maybe, maybe I would have been okay with this if they had done some kind of character development with this. A scene where he's lamenting this and he needs to be comforted and Lois and Martha just tell him stuff, yo, yo, it's greater good, just something. But no, it's not. Superman yells out in anguish over this. And next scene, he destroys a drone that was apparently spying on him in front of General Swanwick. He tells him that he's their friend, but to stop trying to figure out a secret identity, and that Swanwick needs to convince the higher-ups to trust him. People criticize this scene too, especially its placement right next to the killing Zod scene, but like... I don't care. It was a dick move after he just literally saved the world, and who cares about a spy plane after what just happened? And clearly time has passed, and he can't be mopey about his murder forever, I guess. Clark and Martha visit Jonathan's grave. He always believed you were meant for greater things. I just wish you could have been here to see it finally happen. I could really use a lecture from him to say that the drone is proof that they will never trust me and I should stop trying to save people. And flashback to Clark as a child wearing a cape to foreshadow his destiny as Superman, but like, Superman is the archetypical superhero. It's where the cape and pose came from originally. Who is he supposed to be emulating here? Captain Marvel? Martha asks him what he'll do when not being a superhero, and he says he needs to find a job where he can keep an eye on things and look into evil things afoot without drawing suspicion. And so our movie ends with him arriving at the Daily Planet to become a reporter... Despite having no journalism degree, nor any interest in or knowledge of the field before then. Hell, I can't even be certain that Clark has a college degree, but now he's a reporter and wearing glasses. And then, 11 minutes of credits. I know I've been keeping it very much on the down low this whole video, but... I don't think this movie is very good. In fact, I think it sucks! I think I've been pretty thorough in all the reasons why. It's shot weirdly, a lot of scenes and ideas are unnecessary, the music is boring and lifeless, and its greatest sin is having the ethos of Superman twisted. Jonathan Kent is continually telling him to not be Superman, not be the kind of person who cares more about others than himself, and in the end, the man who is supposed to be the person we aspire to be... kill someone. The frequent thing I get told about this movie is that, well, this is a movie about Clark's journey to become Superman. He isn't the Superman we know and love yet. This is an origin story of how he becomes that and how he learns that it's wrong to kill and won't ever do it again. And by the end, he's the kind of Superman we wanted. That might be a good point. If he was ever tempted to do anything else but be Superman. He's been Superman since he was a little kid. He doesn't need to make some grand choice between his Kryptonian heritage and humanity. He's automatically on humanity's side. He keeps saving people and helping people time and time again throughout the story with no expectation of anything in return. He's a good person at heart who keeps trying to be a good person and rejects everyone who says, stop being such a good person. And as for him needing to learn not to kill people, I don't know about you, but... I don't have amazing powers and abilities, and I didn't have to murder anyone to learn that killing is bad. I hate it. I hate this movie. 
I'm going to be generous and say that there's potentially a good movie here. Cut out the stuff with Zod at the end. Get the colors above grayscale. Have Jonathan be cautious, but not discouraging. Trim down some scenes here and there. And get some music that sounds more heroic. And this could be a decent Superman movie. Not a great one, but a solid foundation for future films. As it is, though, no. I'm never coming back to this crappy film ever again. And next time, we'll have a review that's considerably shorter and less anger-inducing. Godzilla Kingdom of Monsters. <laughs>